All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, just to let you know, the webinar will be starting in a couple of more minutes. So thanks for your attendance so far. All right, just before we kick off, I might just get everybody to raise their hand, um, their virtual webinar hand, if they can hear us, just to ensure that everybody can hear us okay. Terrific! It looks like uh, looks like uh, most people have raised their hands, so that's great. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for taking the time out of your busy Fridays to attend this webinar today. Uh, we know that you'll get a lot out of it from our presenter, Chris Price, who is the founder of XREV. Um, who are probably best known for their excellent Revit add-ins. Uh, my name is Nicholas Kurth and I'm here with my co-host Kent Watson. Um, we will have a Q&A session at the end of the presentation, so if you do have any questions, uh, please just enter them into the question box um, and we'll endeavour to answer as many of them as we can at the end of the presentation. Um, so we'll just get a bit of background on why Chris is here. Um, and obviously why he's the best person to talk this through with you guys. Um, so Chris, how long have you been using Revit? Uh, oh yeah, I've been using Revit on a daily basis since about 2001. Yeah, um, so yeah, so what version was that? Uh, that was Revit 4.0, which was just before Autodesk acquired it. Oh yeah, so obviously quite a long time there. Um, and I understand that you've also been involved in the Revit beta program. Um, so yeah, what, how has your involvement been implemented um, since that time? Um, well, let's just say a number of times early in the release of Revit, a new feature seemed to pop up that was perfect for the project I happened to be working on at the time. <laughs> nice. Um, 
So this is Kent here for everyone else. Uh, so basically, Chris, you've also been involved um, in establishing the Australia and New Zealand Revit Standards, um, also known as the ANZRS. Can you tell us what they are and why you took the time out of your demanding schedule to be involved with that? Sure. Um, so at the time, there was no decent, consistent or easily usable content available. Um, manufacturers were starting to get involved but really had no reference to what represented quality content. So we as a user base started piecing together a standard to define what we wanted to see as an end user and thus, be thus began ANZRS. Now the benefit for, benefit for any companies using ANZRS internally for their own company is they have a plethora of content and now templates available for easy integration into their own libraries. Cool. And uh, I know you've worked on a number of multi-billion dollar projects around the globe. Would you share some of those with us? Happy to. Um, so my first big project um, was the King Abdullah U University of Science and Technology in Saudi Arabia, uh, where I worked on the beacon. Um, this was an extremely complex precast concrete spire, which involved some seriously complicated parametric form creation. And unfortunately, it was back at a time before Revit had the conceptual massing tools um, that it has today. Um, I've also been involved with the new Royal Adelaide Hospital, where I did a lot of the development of the curtain wall facade families and seismic joint systems, which was quite uh, extent. And most recently, the new Perth Stadium producing fabrication le level modelling of the facade, which involved a bit of dynamo work with some powerful adaptive components. Yes, I was privileged enough to see some of the hard work that went into the um, Perth Stadium there. There were some pretty, pretty impressive formulas, etc., behind all that content. Um, so uh, you're going to share with us today how to achieve better, smarter documentation in Revit. What, in your opinion, is the most important component to achieve this? Um, as you're probably aware, content is king when it comes to producing high quality documentation efficiently from Revit. Whilst having manufactured content available, like the ones available through our design content service, sometimes it's a little inflexible as it's only been designed to the specific features of the manufacturer's product. And in our industry, there's a need to quickly change design whilst maintaining consistency in, in representation. Uh, today we'll be demonstrating some of the content and templates we've been working on for the past six months. Uh, all our content has been developed with adherence to ANZRS. However, as this standard hasn't really been updated in around five years, uh, we've taken the liberty to expand it to enable us to do everything in a consistent and high quality way. So that in involved you know, creating some additional standards um, along the same lines of what represents ANZRS for things like material and assets, um, fill patterns, text styles, um, line patterns, line styles, um, and tagging, uh, etc. Et um, so, so far we've developed the following extensive um, content suites. So we have a door suite, casework, ladders, parking, structural framing, structural columns, structural foundations and footings, there's a material and asset library, and we've done system family suites for floors, walls including stacked and curtain walls, ceilings, roofs including fascias and gutters, and we've recently put together a couple, uh, some templates for multiple dis discipline practices, as well as specific ones for architecture, structure and um, services. Um, currently in development are curtain wall doors, an accessibility suite, railings, and an office suite. So every suite that we do, we do it so um, we sit down and we work out um, based on our experience and with feedback from end users um, what the types of capabilities they want out of components for that category. So for example, with doors, we sat down and we worked out you know, what are we going to need for doors, what's going to cover 95% of project door requirements. Um, the most effective way to explain the quality and features of the content is through a live demonstration of it in action. Uh, so without further delay, let's jump into Revit. Most of the content has been built natively in Revit 2015 to allow for maximum support. As we know, not everyone is running the latest versions. 
Uh, the exception being this. Yeah, sure. Before you go on, Chris, we're not seeing your screen just yet. Yeah, I'm aware of that. I was about to share it. Um, so sharing it now. So give it a couple of seconds to come up. Is that up now? Perfect. Good stuff. Um, so with the exception being the structural content, which has been built in Revit 2016, uh, to take advantage of all the latest um, structural shape and the new advanced steel connection functionality, uh, because there were some additional parameters and stuff added in 2016 that um, meant we could only half implement it if we made it support 2015 as well. Um, so I'm going to begin with the doors. Um, so hopefully you can see, here's my door library up at the moment. Um, so you can see there's quite a variety in there. This is just a sample of what's, what's possible in this door suite. So if I just switch to my 3D view, let's go to a plan. So you can see what systems we've got available. So we have bifold, corner stacking cavity sliders, corner cavity sliders, stacking cavity sliders, so on and so forth, and then face sliders. Um, hinged and pivot hinge doors, single and double, operable walls, roller doors, sectional overhead doors, accordion, sliding, corner versions of those uh, as well. Um, so we believe that's um, a good coverage of what people require in terms of those doors. Um, so with those um, doors, we've developed um, detail level control in them. So for example, I'm viewing it fine at the moment, but if I switch the view to course, go away Revit, um, you'll see that we get very simplistic representations of all these doors. So we're just seeing pretty plain panels. Um, in some cases we'll see a frame, but in most cases it's, it's pretty basic. It's just, a, just an opening and a panel within that. So it's going to be really lightweight on your model when you're doing it in course detail and you're mainly going to doing that when you're sort of at that um, macro level zoomed right out. Um, and similarly in plan, so at plan at course detail we have very simple representations of all the actual systems. So hopefully the screen's keeping up with everyone and it's not, I'm not moving too fast for you guys. Um, so then if we look, good stuff. Um, so then if we look at medium detail level, we'll start to see the actual detail of the panel itself. We'll see the, um, so in case of louvers, we're just seeing um, a solid fill with a pattern on it as opposed to any sort of individual louver blades. Um, we're starting to see some hardware, so you can see some kick panels there. Um, and we're seeing the actual frames and things as well now. Um, and then at fine detail level, we start to see all the details. So actual hardware, um, actual louver blades, um, things like all your supports and framing or um, and battens and things like that for different types of sectional overhead doors and roller shutters. Nice. Yeah, there's a lot of detail there. Yeah. Um, so because this is all set up so it's only visible at fine detail, it means you can have this detail without the performance impacts, um, you know, by simply setting the view to medium or coarse. Uh, so, similarly, if I go back to my plan view, so I'm just going to quickly, just so you can see the differences when I cycle through these, let's look at the hinge door, for example. I'm going to switch that to medium, so you can see the actual, you know, we can start getting the frame detail showing up, um, depending on what type of frame it is. So. Yeah, and at fine, fine detail in plan, there's no difference between medium. It's it's the same representation um, because of that hardware is not visible in plan anyway. Um, you'll see a lot of the stuff is dashed overhead automatically, so we can you know make sure we get the clearances and things like that. Um, you may have noticed when I was in 3D before, we have 
um, the 3D AS1428.1-2009 disability clearances um, required for all the different door types. Um, and they're all set up so you can 3D clash detect the clearance zones for those doors. Um, and they're done in a smart way so that, um, let's go back to to find view. Um, you can see and plan which the, what the approach type is and it's really easy to go and change the approach type. So down over here in the instance properties of this particular door, we can see that it's set to open away approach type three, which is front side approach. Um, you'll notice in a lot of this content, there are tool tips built up. So you can see popping up now is that zero equals the hinge side, one equals latch side, two is either side, and three is a front approach. So yeah, very that's, easily. That, that's yep. very nice. It helps people see what they're what they're selecting. Yep. Um, so very easily, I could change the approach type of the away side, and you'll see that representation updating in plan. Um, so we can make sure that we've got things set correctly. Um, and for things for cases where you. Um, have a non-compliant door, for example, let's say I'm going to quickly change this door from a 920 to an 820 door, and those of you familiar with the code know that an 820 door will not have uh, the required clearances to meet um, the code requirements. So we should instantly get an error message coming up saying this door does not comply. Um, so on a global scale, say you don't want to see any of these warnings, that's fine. Um, you you know, know for a fact that a 920 door, sorry for an 820 door, it doesn't need to doesn't need to tell you you know it's non-compliant. So you can just turn that warning off um, in here. And again, you can see there's tool tips in there that explain what it does. Okay. Excellent. Um, similarly, if I don't want to see these clearances at all. Um, either in plan or in 3D, they can be controlled by subcategory. Um, so these are actually set up as shared family. So you can see if I tab select it, it's a generic model. Um, so now if I go to my visibility settings, I can go into generic models and I can turn off the clearance zones and the arrows. Okay, and now I don't see any of that information. And likewise, I can do that in any view. Um, so you could set that up in your view templates if that's you want to have one specific view where you go and, and um, review all your clearance requirements, um, maybe in one 3D view and in one, one plan view, um, and then all the other views can have it off by default. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so with regards to the actual door, so there's, there's literally hundreds of thousands of types pre-set up in some type catalogs for you guys. Um, so that's basically to try and make things as user friendly as possible. We know that you know having a lot of parameters in a door can be overwhelming, um, even though we have tried to make it as user friendly as possible by having all these tool tips and things be easily explained on what they do. Um, and everything's being created consistently. So from one door to another, you have the same sort of parameters and the same sort of layout. So it doesn't take long to become familiar with how they're set up. Um, but to aid things so you don't have, people, users don't have to go and mess with parameters at all, there's extensive type catalogs set up. And when I say extensive, if I have a look here in the folder, um, you'll see for a bifold corner door, a multiple corner door, a little preview there, the actual type catalog is 66 meg. Um, so that has, I believe that one has about 400,000 types predefined. Um, now, because of that, it does mean when you try and load it into Revit, it takes Revit a bit of time to um, display the type catalog because it's trying to load that many types. Um, because we wanted to make all the types available to the end user, we've decided to distribute it that way, but you can very easily um, delete the types that are unapplicable to you. So I can change the file extension to CSV and open the file in Excel. Come on, even Excel takes a little bit of time to open up a file that big. So 
while that's opening, Chris, I noticed um, you know with the doors, you know, there's different panels, and um, some have high window highlights, etc., over over the top of the doors. How many how many families um, do you use to create? Uh, you know, say for example, the uh, the single hinge door with all the um, additional features on it. So there's only one single hinge door, and there's one double hinged, uh, sorry, double door, um, hinged double door. Uh, yep. So the idea is to make it, there's one door of each system type. So there's only 20 doors that can do, you know, literally a million different types. Um, yeah, wow. So again, that's just trying to make things as easy for you as possible. Um, so just quickly showing you, like if I scroll down to the bottom of this one, you know, we're up to 184,321 types in this particular type catalog. So you could quite quickly um, create a table and filter the columns and delete the ones that you think you'll never use and maybe save a copy of that um, and rename the old um, type catalog. And mm -hmm. that way you can um, get rid of that delay with the loading up of the content um, for the ones with the larger type catalogs. And then yes, all you need to do is save it and then simply change the file extension back to TXT uh, and then you won't see those other ones. Um, but the advantage of having those type catalogs, if I go and load one of these doors, um, so let's load in the single hinged door. So that's all the doors that are in the, in the library that can do everything. Um, right. We can load that one up. So the type catalog is going to come up in a few seconds. So what's the advantage of having all these different configurations in in so few families? Uh, standardization. So we can have all the doors looking consistent quite easily. Um, they're all going to function the same way. Um, Performance-wise, we're not having to load up so many families into the Revit project, so that's going to keep your file size down. So although this family, uh, let's say this door family at the moment is, uh, where we're we in the single hinge door, is 1.2 meg, 1.28 meg. Um, that also includes um, the nested components that go into that. So that's things like the, um, the door hardware it's as well and the actual 3D clearance zones. So if I was to pull those out, the file size would be even smaller. It might be more like six or seven hundred kilobytes. Um, so, because they're set up as shared nested components, all the doors actually share those um, same um, components. So, although when I load this family in, it's saying it's going to add, you know, one point um, one point two eight meg to my project file size, each new type only adds four kilobytes. Um, so. Uh, and then because you're not actually getting a full 1.28 um, meg of extra file size on your project, you're also, because the, all, the, um, all the other doors are sharing those same components, um, you're only going to get small incremental upgrades for the file size. Um. Okay. So what you're saying is if I load the single, single hinge door, um, that, that might be a bit larger in file size, but if I load the double hinge door as well, that they're all using the same components, so there's, it actually isn't the same as adding a total of the two, two file sizes that actually end up being smaller than the total of the two file sizes, is that correct? Correct, that's right, yeah. Um, and similarly, like if, if we were taking a conventional door library um, where someone might have 20 doors for all the different um, hinge door types they've had in their project and maybe each one of those is only 400 kilobytes, you know, you're adding 12, 20 times 400 kilobytes is a lot more than this one door of 1.2 meg that does more than what those 20 doors can do. Yeah, right. Um, so yeah, within these type catalogs, um, you can filter. So if I want a 2340 head height, and maybe I know I want it to be uh, an 820 door. Um, and you know, there's all sorts of parameters and stuff we can filter on. So maybe I want it to have a metal frame. 
um, and maybe I want to have a door grill and all of a sudden I've reduced a list of what was you know, 10,000 options to just a select few um, and pick the ones that I actually want and then just load those specific ones that I want into my project. So that's a big benefit of having these type catalogs being set up and you can see we've pre-populated all the, um, a lot of the parameters as well. So again, it's instantly going to be re there ready for your scheduling purposes. Yep. Um, so uh, included in the library. Kiwis. Sorry, we've got a few Kiwis uh, in on the, uh, the webinar as well and they're asking sure you know, about the different um, door sizes, you know, they, they use an 810 door instead of an 820 door, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so we have it included in our, in our type catalogs ourselves, those um, particular size options. Um, but again, it's very, very simple to open up that um, file in Excel and do a swap and replace of all 820s to, and change them to 810s. Um, yep. So, you know, that, that's not difficult and, you know, um, as we get more New Zealand um, people on board, we'd be happy to create a New Zealand specific type catalogue just as we'd look, be looking to do a US or a UK specific type catalogue. Yep, cool. Um, so with these components, we've also included a suite of hardware and a suite of panels. So if we have a look some of the thumbnails. So these are the hardware we include outside of the box. Um, and panel wise, so all these panels are pretty parametric anyway. Um, so for example, all these um, panels for sliding doors and swing doors and stuff actually have options already built in for vision panels and kick plates and side plates and all that sort of stuff which I'll show shortly. Um, but it's very easy to grab one of these and do a save as and use it as a template to add additional panel options that maybe aren't built into the families themselves. So maybe there's a, there's a funky um, routing pattern you want to put into the panel surface itself. Um, you could do that quite easily and still maintain use of the same family. Okay, so looking at the actual capabilities and properties of the actual families themselves, so let's look at a pivot array. Um, it's consistent across all hinge doors, so we'll just talk about hinges um, generally. So what parameters do we have in here? We have options to control the handle um, for both the internal and external side, and for a double door, you know, it's every panel. So for panel A and panel B, you have options to control the hardware. Mm -hmm. Um, we can control the handle elevation, the handle offset from the frame, um, you know, the open angle in plan, um, the wall offset. So, you know, maybe I've, my wall is made up of three different walls um, and I want to push the wall in a little bit. You know, I can offset my wall, my door outside of the wall if need be. Um, and there are options within this wall. So this one at the moment you can see is a wraparound type frame. So the actual type is called wraparound. Um, there is a property in here where I can explicitly define the frame width instead of using the wall thickness. Um, and so I could make this a 150 frame um, explicitly. Um, so the times we want to have it in a blockwork wall, for example, where it's not fully wrapping around uh, a 200 blockwork wall. Um, options to control architraves internally and externally, um, whether or not it's a cupboard. So if it's a cupboard, then it's going to turn your hardware off on the inside of the panel. Um, you can turn the handle off altogether. We already discussed about approach type. Um, and then at the type level, we can control the frame type. So it's a drop down list here. Um, the panel type. We can control materials of everything. So architraves, the door frame, the door panel the glazing and the kicker, kick plate, um, and the doors themselves are controlled by panel size. So you'll see that the width and heights and clear openings and stuff are all automatically calculated based on all the other data. 
um, control glazing thicknesses, shadow lines, um, side plates, sizes, wall lapping, things like that. So um, there's endless capabilities in terms of all that stuff and then you can control whether there's a door grill, a kick plate, a mid rail, a side plate, a vision panel and you can see we're using all the ANZRS shared parameters for those. Um, control whether or not there's a, a single or double rebate. Um, again, what I was talking about before with matching the wall thickness or having an explicitly desired um, wall um, frame size um, or whether the hinge is double acting, so in this case it is. Um, and whether or not there's a shadow line um, or like a timber shadow line. And I think I've got one down here somewhere. So there you can see that shadow line happening on the frame um, for that timber frame door. Wow. Um, so that that's generally the functionality across the hinge doors. Um, and then so we've got our base sliders. And again, everything's kind of consistent. So you've got similar sort of parameters for handle positions, um, the hardware types, architraves. And I notice as you're hovering over these, they seem to all have a tool tip behind them as well. That's right, yep. Um, so again, that's what I was getting at. You can, everything's consistent. So it might seem like a lot to get hold of it initially, but once you've learnt one door, they all basically work the same and anything that's different, there's a tool tip that explains why it's different and what it does. Um, so, you know, for example, in a face slider, we've got a few more options for things like helmets um, and the track sizing and things like that. Um, yep. So we can have a helmet, an exposed rail, bottom rolling, um, whether or not there's a stop. So if I jump into 3D, we can just pan over some of these. Um, so a face slider, let's spin around so we can see the actual side that it's sliding on. So let's see, you know, here's some more with sort of industrial style rails and exposed hinges. We can do that sort of thing. Um, or conventional sort of hidden tracks, um, timber versions. Um, so you have lots and lots of different options within those. Um, and you can have louvered panels, um, glazed panels, patch fittings, things like that. They're all built in. Um, then you have your cavity sliders. So with your cavity sliders, they're actually um, being set up so they're quite smart about working out where the cavity of the wall is. So you can see in here, um, it does actually have all the internal details. So you could clash detect if you're going to say you had a, a steel column in there it would you know um, it would pick up that up in a clash detection because it has got the framing um, modeled into that void space and the track and the head so um, the cool thing about this is if I go and so let's say I create a new wall type and this one maybe has only one layer of plasterboard on the exterior side um, the Cavity is automatically detected, um, so you can see it automatically repositions itself over that um, core area. Um, yeah, wow. So, um, so that's cavity sliders, and then you have stacker versions of those. So it'll um, they can have up to three panels for memory for stacking. Um, then you have your corner versions, and with your corner versions, you have both internal and external corner options because these do have architrave and um, options, so it's not as simple as just to flip. Things have to change sides of the walls and things like that, so there's an explicit option within the properties to control whether or not it's a corner exterior or a corner interior. So, so, you're, so what you're saying is both the exterior corners and the interior corners are the one family? Correct, yeah. Wow. How long did it take you to get that sorted out? Um, so that particular family literally took days to create just because when things flip over, things have to flip in the other direction and there's a lot of, like, if I was to just, you know, to show some of the smarts and the difficulty and the time we put into these particular components to try and make them do all this um, functionality, um, 
you'll see there's a lot of um, formulas and stuff that are working out where geometry needs to sit. Um, so, you know, we can't just use a simple, um, because you can't have a parameter go into a negative state, we have to have, you know, reference planes out here and offset long distances. So when it does flip over, nothing moves into a negative um, and cause things to break. So we've tried to put a lot of validation into the content. So generally things shouldn't break. The content's supposed to be self-repairing. So if you do something that um, technically is impossible, um, the door should validate itself and basically limit itself within its minimum or maximum requirements. Mm. Um, you'll see with all these ones as well, they have options for highlights. Uh, where are we? There's the highlights. I can find one with the highlight. Um, these ones have highlights. There we go. Here's some corner ones with highlights on them. Okay. Wow. Um, how are we going for time? Just don't want to spend yeah. too much time on doors. <laughs> um, very impressive. But yeah, for the other ones I might just quickly touch on um, uh, things like your upperable walls. So with your upperable walls, you can control the different ways in which they stack. So it can be remote stacked, central stacked, um, or side stacked. Um, and you can see here, you can actually go down to the point of controlling every single panel. So you might have one panel in there that's operable, um, or it might be a panel that has an operable wall within a panel, operable door within a panel. Um, you can have pin boards and all sorts of things all built in. Um, mm. And things like with your roller doors and your, um, and your sectional overheads, you know, you can control whether or not they have operators. Um, remote operators and you know they could be the side fixed ones, they could be within the drum itself or they can be industrial style ones with cable, um, with sorry, chain operated versions So you can have your sort of retail based stuff with your clear light um, and you can offset the heads um, so things don't clash and you can have this sort of thing happening. Um, and they have options to control, if I was to go to a find view really quickly. Um, where are we over here? Where are they? Um, I've lost them. Where are they go? Oh, here they are. Yep. Um, so you can see the actual mullions um, have options for different types of corner mullions and things like that. Yeah, right. Um, and you can see in here they also have 3D clearances zones built in for um, for those mechanism operations and stuff, so you can make sure that um, it's all going to fit. We've got a question here about the um, those clearance zones. Do they do they actually identify or alert if if there is a clash? Um, not automatically. No, there's no functionality we can do directly in a family that would um, be able to detect whether another piece of geometry is passing through it. Um, that's something you would either you need to use Revit's interference checking capabilities or um, when you've exported it out um, into Navisworks or some other um, clash detection tool. Okay. So yeah, they're 3D objects that can be used for um, interference checks though. Correct, yeah. Yep. Um, um, th and just quickly as well, with things like the operable walls, um, they do um, operate um, as standalone families. They're actually not hosted by a wall itself. Um, that's because they are typically floor to ceiling. Um, so, and likewise with the accordion doors, you can see there's no wall there because they're a room separation device. Um, so those ones have deliberately been created as unhosted just because there's issues in Revit, if you go and place a wall and then put a door in it that occupies the entire extent of that wall and then try and copy it somewhere, or if say it's in a group or something like that, you'll get issues because the wall that's hosting the door doesn't get copied and Revit can't create the door. So we've, we've thought about all those types of issues that you might come across. Yep. But, they're, but they're still um, placed using the door tool and schedule as a door? Correct, yes. Um, and so just before I move on to the next suite, 
uh, if I have a look at their door schedule, you'll see um, these are all the doors that are in this particular project um, and all the parameters and stuff that are pre-populated. So, um, so we've got all the accessory information, all the sizing information, all materials and finishes, um, identity data and classifications. So assembly codes in Omniclass have been defined. So if you're pushing out to um, your quantity surveyor and they're using Costex or something, you know, this information being pre-populated will really help them and be able to give you a quick turnaround on costing. Um, so yeah, everything's sort of pre-populated, ready to go with all your parameter data. Um, using those ANZRS parameters. Mm -hmm. All right, so next suite is our casework suite. Um, and we're about 20 minutes behind schedule, so we'll have to skip one of the ones down the track. But um, with the casework suite, again, if we just quickly look at detail level control. At course, detail level control. We have a um, very simple box representation. So what this means is you can use this for really early concept stuff. Um, you just have your view set to course um, and you don't have to worry about how the doors are broken up, what type of hardware is on them, you know, whether they're shelving, whether they're overhead cupboards or things like that. It's all kind of, you know, it doesn't matter at this point. Um, but then as your project progresses, rather than having to swap families out and things like that, it's just a matter of changing the detail level and then you can start defining how they're broken up. So at medium detail level, you can actually see the way the panels, uh, the way the carcasses are broken up um, with the different front options on them. Um, and then at fine detail, we start seeing the actual hardware information. So, you know, whether it's got handles, whether they're horizontal or vertical, whether it's got, you know, cutouts, um, you know, recessed pulls, um, lip pulls and things like that. It's all sort of built in. We, the, the, the casework library comes with a complete um, suite of different hardware options which should cover most um, common scenarios. Um, you can see with the fronts we have different options, you know, whether you want ornate sort of style fronts or something, you know, more modern. Um, you'll see you can have it set up so the, in this case, this drawer sits um, within the actual carcass or whether it overlaps the carcass. Um, so the way these are all set up is you can control, you know, the number of um, bays that, are, that make them up. So all of these are the same family. Um, it's very, very easy. So this is just that same family. The only difference is it has one bay instead of eight bays. So that's the same as that. Um, and then for each bay, you can control what it is. So in this case, it's a draw with the horizontal slimline handle. Um, but I could make it a cupboard. Um, I can make it an ornate drawer. Um, there's all sorts of options for different panels that you can go and select on there. Um, so then with your shelving, I get, uh, again, you have options to control you know, the number of shelves, um, whether or not that shelf spacing is equal, like so. So if it's not equal, then you can actually control the height of the individual shelves, so desired shelf height, blah, 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 blah. Um, and we've got some parameters in here. Um, if you are, when you are setting the number of bays, to be able to work out how many that your bay values all add up to meet the opening that's in there. Um, so there's like a required, what it needs to add up to, and then what yours actually add up to. So if those match, then you won't get any issues with the bays sort of overlapping the top or anything like that. Um, you can see with these, you have options for uh, your hanging rails. So this one has two hanging rails. You can see the other one just there. Um, you have options for things like top infills. So it needs to you know, fill a bit over the top. Um, and again, all of these have full um, full tool tips to explain all the different options. Most things in these cases are instance based just because uh, for maximum flexibility um, we understand what you're needing to do there. Corner options um, and then at your type parameters you just have things like the kicker size, the depth of the actual um, panel, the carcasses. 
um, and cupboard frame sizes if it's a glazed cupboard for example and whether or not it's got a kicker or a handle. Um, so there's all sorts of combinations you can do. Um, so then you have your combination units which can be a mix of drawers and shelves, open shelving, um, fixed shelving, cupboards as well. So again this is the same family, works on the exact same principles of all the others. So you specify the bay count, specify the shelf count if there's shelves as well, um, whether the bay spacing is equal. So if that's selected then you don't have to worry about you know, ticking any and working out what the bay spaces need to be. But if you don't have if you deselect that then you can control the height of the individual bays. Um, we can control the handles on them, so whether they're a whether they're centered horizontally or centered vertically for both cupboards and drawers. Um, the inset option is whether or not the, the front overlaps the carcass or it's, it's inset to the carcass. So um, you can see the open options here for shelving. And with all of this stuff, it's all fully customizable. So if I was to jump back into the casework suite here. So for that whole all these different options you're seeing here is all being done with you know, these few families. Um, and then so you have all your front options in here and we have all our hardware options. So we have a cutout, edge pull, flush pull and then slimline handles um, for both horizontal and vertical orientation. And this, those handles are all smart enough to work out, they know where the panel is, so if you want to set them at the top, if, as soon as they're over one metre in, in height, the handle knows to switch to the bottom edge of the um, front as opposed to being at the top edge. So all that stuff is built in functionality. Um, bench top, so even something as simple as a bench top, this is one family that can do straight L or U shaped bench tops um, and you can have bull nose options on those and within those bull nose options you can control, you know, say maybe this edge sits along a wall so you can turn the bull nose off just on that edge um, and do things like that. Um, and because these are casework families it means if I go and paste, host the Clark sinks for example to them which have voids built into them automatically, they will cut an opening um, so you don't need to coordinate an opening in the bench annually. Um, these barbacks and splashbacks are set up as line based families so they're very easy to place um, and then they have mitering options built into them so you, whether you're mitering on an internal or an external corner um, so you get a nice clean join and don't end up with a double line at the end. Um, and then you have your end panel cables and things like that. Um, so maybe you're doing a refrigerator space so you'd have your overhead cupboard in here and then you'd have your cables either side. Um, so as part of this suite our plan is to also do things like um, have a whole bunch of pre-configured layouts. At the moment we've just sort of shown what's possible but we have plans to also do some sample assemblies that you can literally just copy paste into your project and assign some different materials to them. Um, so that's the casework suite. Uh, so then there's the parking suite. So again, like the door suite, the parking suite has these 3D clearance zones um, built into them. So you can see in here we have our um, AS2890 parking envelope built in um, and similarly for disabled parking bays you can see we also have that 3D clearance um, allowed in there. Um, we have one set up for our shared spaces as well and they can be um, you know, rotated. Um, so this is a 90 degree bay but if it's a 60 degree or a 45 degree bay then all this will automatically rotate um, and resize. Um, so all the line work is smart um, and the bollard automatically sits in the correct location as per the code. Um, these are set up as line based families so they're really easy to go and you know adjust to the appropriate um, lengths. If I grab the right end like so. Um, so within that suite you get all those. Um, 
I select the individual bays, you can see um, they have options in there for whether it's short term or long term car parking, um, whether or not the clearance zone is visible, whether it's, it's a disabled bay, which will of course display your, um, your symbol, um, whether it's a rear in bay, what type of user class it is. So again, that automatically updates these sorts of minimum bay width and, and minimum bay length requirements. So it will report if your um, components are non-compliant, um, whether or not there's a wheel stop and whether there's a wheel stop tall obstruction because that of course adjusts the, um, the different requirements for the bay itself. So basically so, you just select the options you want and it does all the thinking for you. Exactly. So within this family I can say that well, at the moment it's a 540, uh, 5400 by 2790 degrees with a wheel stop. Um, maybe I want them all to be uh, at 60 degrees. You know, it's going to do that automatically. The only thing I need to describe here is tell that that it's a 60 degree bay and then it automatically spaces them. Okay, so really, really simple. Um, we've also got ones in there for doing like your line marking. So these are line based families as well. There's ones in there for speed bumps. Um, and within this one um, road hump family, it has all the different options as well um, for different types of profiles. So you have AS, the two AS2890 profiles, you have flat top plateaus and watts profile options on those. So here you can see that's the same family as that, but a different um, requirement. It's doing the proper chevron marking and then that's a pedestrian crossing family that goes across. Um, and it's set up so if you need to run it at an angle, um, you can actually, you know, maybe this needs to be at 60 degrees, the lines will automatically um, skew. So we can do stuff like that. We have mm -hmm. pram ramp families in there which will automatically cut floors and, and curbs um, for different types of, and there's different types of pram ramps. So there's the attached ones or you have your, um, your inserted ones and there's also um, the horizontal, forget the other ones. Um, and then similarly we have all our bike parking and again it's got all smarts built into it as well so it knows about, um, you know, specify the bike parking device type, um, you can specify the angle of the bay and the offset. Um, it has smarts again to work out what the Clearances need to be based on the, you know the type of arrangement you've set them up. So if you've offset them, then you get more clearance requirements um, enabled, and you have both floor-mounted or face-mounted options here as well. Um, with all your car parking, you also have options for parallel bays, um, and there's a whole bunch of street arrows. And again, that's all the same family, so you've got options built into those. But just, uh, Chris, just with uh, some time constraints here, I know we're getting close to the end of the uh, the webinar. Yep. Um, how important is the uh, a, a good template to um, you know make this documentation etc. easy? Uh, well, a good template's important always. Um, so we've been busy building some um, super. Um, detailed templates which basically have you know title blocks predefined so you can just go and shove your logos uh, in there or maybe you didn't want to make some further configurations to those. They have smarts built in um, for north pointers and issue stamps, um, controlling the north directions, whether or not it's a cover sheet. Um, so this is the startup view for this particular template. This is the multidisciplinary template that I'm showing right now. Um, you can see sort of some of the sample graphical styles that are set up in here in terms of dimensions and things like that. Um, we've got model disclaimers for issuing your model and you know model level of uh, level of detail information and things like that. And there's instructions so when you're starting a new project, so you know it tells you what you need to do first up. So the user basic any user can pick this up and know what to do out of the box. Um, so you've got instructions on new project startup here, talking about how you go and set up your survey and get your coordinates correct and things like that. So it's working, 
walking the user through the process. Mm -hmm. um, you'll see in terms of fill patterns and stuff, we've got everything sort of already set up. We've got all our model um, surface patterns pre-set up. We have a plethora of materials pre-set up. So, and these are all render ready with um, with photorealistic textures and all your assets applied to them. Um, they're set up so that the actual hatch patterns correctly align um, with this with the rendering material as well. So you can correctly set them out in your documentation. Mm. Um, so oops, that's the wrong one. Um, so yeah, if we have a look quickly in the materials in here. Yeah, we have so one of the things I've struggled with. Tree. One of the yep. things I've struggled with with materials is often they're not they're not that um, Australianized, I suppose. Yep. Out of the generic rabbit library that comes with it, so these look look like they're a lot more usable. Yeah, yeah. So you've got your different roof types. You've got you know uh, polished concrete options, marble. Um, there's a lot of different timber options in here. So we have options. You know, this is realistic mode, so they're not looking particularly good, but they're set up so a lot of the materials have been set up so they're procedural, so they're very easily scaled. Um, so you can change your tile patterns um, to be running bond, stack bond, Flemish bond with the flick of a switch, rather than having to create a new texture. Um, same with the, um, all these timber ones as well. So there's Tasmanian oak, there's western red cedar options in there. Um, so this is spotted gum, for example. Um, and then really quickly, all our wall types, for example. You know, there's a whole bunch in here um, with different um, curtain wall types preset up with different layouts. Of, um, you know, whether it be f um, face glazed or center glazed um, options for aluminium and timber frames. So when you're using your curtain walls, whether you're using um, precast, uh, sorry, tilt up um, you know, battens and things like that. Um, and then you have all your um, different information pre-assigned, so you can see in here all the parameter data that has been assigned to these particular elements. Um, and likewise with the materials, if I look at the material schedule, you know, all this data is set up there with your descriptions, um, models, and things like that is predefined wherever it makes sense. Yeah. So. With all these parameters and um, stuff, the doors, the parking, the structural framing, ladders, etc., the uh, does the template contain tagging to support those as well? It does. Yeah, there's a an extensive suite of tags um, as well as standard drawing sets and things like that built into here um, for all different disciplines. So if I look in here, you'll see we've got tags bracing symbols, connection symbols for structural. We've got all these different tags for you know just about everything um, mm -hmm. preloaded. Um, property tags, um, space tags. Um, we've got a few different title sheet options, view titles. Um, and everything has literally been thought about. So all your different view types, viewport types, and these have been set up around all the different graphical standards that I've seen people produce. Um, so you can know, have an option there for just about everything. Um, if I was to very quickly go to the cover sheet, for example, within the template, you know, we've got our schedules pre-populated, standard notes ready to go. We're getting information um, about, you know, local authority, county, parish, um, real property description. Um, this is all smart information rather than text. So, mm -hmm. you know, trying to keep nice. it as smart as possible. Um, in terms of view, view templates, there's view templates for every single type of view template you could possibly need to use. So um, you could use this as a basis and maybe tweak the ones that are there rather than having to go and um, create them from scratch. Likewise, there's filters for everything that you'd ever need. 
Um, there's options in here for, um, you've got all your text styles, all your dimension styles, all pre-set up. Um, then in terms of creating new view types, there's actually view types set up. So if I want to take a site plan, a sketch-based site plan, you know, I just pick that, hit OK, and it's already got the view template applied and the graphic styles are already applied, ready for the view to go. Um, and the same thing applies for sections and for um, every other view type. So, so just hate to, hate to cut you short there, Chris, but um, where, where, uh, where can we access this content? Yeah, so all the content um, is available on A2K Technology Lounge, so technologylounge.com.au. Um, we haven't got the templates up there yet, because that's only got completed a few days ago, um, but you can see the different suites in there, and with those you can buy items individually if there's only specific ones you're after, or you can go and buy um, the entire suite. Um, and beyond that, you can also, there is an option to subscribe to all content um, based on a, an annual subscription. Um, and that will give you access to all the content as well as all updates to those particular content items as well as direct input into their content creation. So if you've got um, particular needs in terms of outputs, if you're involved in this um, content service, then you'll actually get the ability to you know, provide that feedback and input into what you need in that content and thus um, get it designed specifically for your, um, your requirements. And when I say that, say your requirements, it, we do have to factor in everyone, so, but it, it, will, it, it has more chance of covering your specific needs um, if you have input uh, into your requirements. Cool. Um, so just a few questions here. Thank you very much for um, for for sharing that with us all, Chris. It's um, incredible what you've been able to achieve with such few, uh, such, such a limited amount of families. Um, so there's 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 been a few questions about the uh, New Zealand standards. Um, so we've sort of touched on that a bit, I guess. The uh, one of the questions has been in, in regards to the elevation swing. Um, yep. So I guess, you know, depending on um, requests from New Zealand, will that, that's something that you're looking at putting in, correct? Yeah, it's something we're, we're definitely doing. Um, I mean, it's, it's very, very easy for us to go and add. It's just because there's 20 doors, well, well, not 20 swing doors, but there's a number of different panel types and things like that that we've got to go and add things to. Um, so yep. yeah, um, let's cut a section through one of those so you can actually see an elevation representation because I didn't actually show that. Uh, let's just do one through there. Um, so yeah, you can see we do have it currently set up so it's um, with the hinges um, with the double point, but yeah, it's it's just an option that we need to put in there to be able to flip it so it's the other way um, for everywhere else because Australia is the only one that does it that way that I'm aware of. <laughs> um, so the other que another question here is: this content all generic models and not manufacturer specific model? Correct. Yeah, everything is. Um, what we've done is we've basically taken a look at what um, we've done some research in you know, for doors or for park sorry not so much parking but um, uh, for manufacturer specific windows would be an example um, we would take a look, we take a look at all the window options that are available from all the different manufacturers and then basically try and create a generic component that can do everything that those manufacturer options might have. Um, so for a sectional overhead door, we've got all the options in there that um, would cover um, everything a manufacturer might provide, but in a generic way so it's not specific to any one manufacturer. Okay, and that's really great, particularly for the um, government projects because they don't, they're not allowed to contain manufacturer specific yeah. Notation in the schedules, correct? Correct, yeah. So in every, you'll see every single door um, has no option against manufacturer, so. Uh, yep. Yeah. Um, 
Uh, there's been a been a request about some short videos demonstrating the uh, the functionality of perhaps a single family or something like that. Mm -hmm. we can um, that. Yeah. Also, um, I guess a question about support regarding you know if they find a door that they they break, what 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 happens there? Yep. So, I, I personally take a lot of pride in all these families that I do create. So if there's something wrong with it, let me know. I want to hear about it and I will fix it up as a matter of urgency. Like we literally, if there's something physically wrong with the door and it's breaking under a legitimate circumstance where it shouldn't, then we will do that, you know, as priority one basically. If it's additional functionality, then we do have a, a sort of a wish list of stuff that um, we're going to add uh, in a future update. Uh, but that's that's different to something breaking. Mm -hmm. um, and are there are there windows coming soon? Um, yes, I believe windows are set for Q3. <coughs> um, just briefly have a look. <coughs> um, so yeah, windows are currently queued up for quarter three as well as vertical transportation, a stairs and a detail suite. Mm -hmm. Cool. We might wrap up there. I'll hand it over to Nick. Yep. All right. Um, yeah, a special thank you to Chris for taking your time out of your day to go through this with everyone. It was definitely very informative. Um, and yeah, obviously also to everyone who has attended today. Um, is there any, any final words you'd like to say, Chris? Um, um, I'm a bit, a bit um, frustrated that I didn't get to get onto the structural content, but um, with the structural content, just really briefly, it does have all your um, analytical information um, predefined. It has um, it has options in there for things like stick symbol offsets. Um, but both vertically and horizontally um, and end um, connection options to control how much they're offset and you know there's bracing options that actually allow actually physically show the connections as well and it all works um, seamlessly with the advanced steel structural connection tools um, so although I wasn't able to get to that um, we've applied the same sort of quality to all content we've created so um, I quickly do have to appreciate that. Can I see a show of hands of, of all those? That would be uh, happy to uh, see another webinar with the structural content and some of the other features that we uh, didn't get to cover. All right, so there's, there's quite a few there. We um, will uh, keep your keep your eyes and ears out, and we'll um, schedule another one. Uh, may not be till earlier in the new year. Now that we're already in December, but um, if we can make it before then, we will. Um, and yeah, also this recording will be saved and uploaded onto YouTube, um, so that once that's publicly made available, um, we'll send it out to an email alongside the current um, suite videos we have available, which also includes um, a bit more information into the doors, um, casework, and parking suites. Um, and I believe there's also some more on the way um, as we put out more and more suites. So thank you everyone for your attendance. I know everybody's uh, busy leading into Christmas, so I really, we really appreciate you um, taking the time out of your busy schedule. Thank you very much, Chris, once again, and uh, we'll uh, be in contact. Thank you.